Firstly, thanks, uh, thanks to everyone for all coming. Um, this is obviously the third instalment of the Agile Roundabout. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, my name's Rob Dawson. I'm one of the consultants at uh, TRG. We're a, an Agile software development recruitment consultancy. Um, so if anyone wants to talk about that afterwards, that's cool. Um, but this is this is all about um, the meetup tonight, and um, just wanted to, to say that. We set this up as a, a collaborative meetup. Um, it's really to give something back to the, the agile community, and um, obviously we want, we want to keep it keep it growing, get the message out there. So um, we have a Twitter hashtag, and we'd love for you guys to tweet about it, um, get it on LinkedIn, any sort of social media. So um, the hashtag is um, just hashtag agile roundabout. Um, so please do bang the drum and we want to keep it um, keep it growing. Um, just wanted to, to say a couple of thanks obviously to equal experts, particularly um, Sophie and Kathleen for helping um, set this all up. Um, and of course our own Beth Hillman for uh, all the work she's, she's done to get this going. Um, and it just leaves me to introduce our speaker, Helen Meek, um, who we're really, really um, lucky to have because she has a she has her own her own meetup group called Agile Coaching Exchange, and um, they do some fantastic talks. So I recommend you all go to go to some of those. Check them out on on meetup. Um, and um, yeah, she she got in touch to say that she wants to get involved, and um, I'm really looking forward to her talk on on Kanban. So um, that's enough for me. I'll leave the leave to it. Brilliant. Thank you. So I do encourage you to tweet, obviously positive things only though, that's, that's my explicit policy if you're thinking about Kanban. So thank you for having me. Just to echo what they've said, the reason why I love doing things like this is because in the 10 years that I've been doing Agile and that I've been doing Kanban, I've met some really important people along that way in my life and they've helped me and guided me. And I recognise that not everybody always has the opportunity in their organisations. And so that's why I like to do things like this to make you know, coaches and trainers accessible so you can get the information that you need to have without worrying about getting it in your organisation. And so that's why meetup groups are really fantastic for this type of thing. So, who exactly am I? Uh-oh, here we go, down. Okay. So this is me. Oh yes, I've got curly hair today. This is, this is also me. I do have straight hair as well. Um, everybody always thinks that this is a professional photo, but it's not. It's actually in Paris in front of a, a leather wall and I had a glass of champagne in my hand because normally I'm drunk so I just zoomed in on the head. Um, so it looks professional but it was actually took by my friend so it was quite good I thought. So I am Helen Meek, I'm an Agile coach and trainer, so I work with lots of different organisations. Um, so I primarily work for a company called Ripple Rock um, and we're a consultancy company and I go into lots of different places to train and to teach and currently I'm literally just down the road in ASOS, um, which is kind of like a fashionista's dream really, um, and I get to learn lots about fashion let alone 40% discount. Okay. So, I'm also working for a company called Learning Connections as well. So all of the training that I presently do, I do via Learning Connections. Um, and I will do a little bit of a sales thing and tell you some dates of my next classes at the end. And it's completely up to you whether you ignore or whether you have another slice of pizza. So I am an accredited Kanban trainer. So what that means is I've been trained by David Anderson. David Anderson being the founder and father of Kanban in the software industry. So he's poked and prodded me to make sure that the knowledge that I give to you is the right knowledge and it's the right message. And when I say poked and prodded, that's kind of like mentally, not physically. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. So let's hope we can have a laugh tonight um, as we do this. So that's quite important to me. So that's a little bit about me. Um, here's a few companies. If you notice my accent, I live in Norfolk. Okay, so I am Norfolk and proud. And if I live in Norfolk, there's probably a high probability that I've actually worked for a Viva or Norwich Union at some point. And I did. You would be right. So I've done 12 <coughs> years there. I served my time before realising there is a better way and that better way is agile. And so since then I've been going around lots of different companies. Here are a few. Rolls Royce. I thought I was going to go to the awesome building with the cars. And I went to the airfield with the jet engines. Um, HP. Fantastic stuff. 
ASOS, it's my second time there. Lots of insurance companies, insurance companies love me. Um, Pearson's Publishing, I've done a lot of work in publishing. Um, some of these, I saw that £60 million diamond, but they would not let me touch it. Okay. I do have my own meetup groups. Um, I have the Kanban Coaching Exchange, which is focused looking at Kanban and the coaching of Kanban. Um, and I also have the Agile Coaching Exchange, kind of like brother and sister. So if you are interested in seeing a little bit more of me or getting involved in other groups, other providers are available. <laughs> Go Agile Roundabout. <laughs> okay. So that's a little bit about me. So who's working with Kanban at the moment in the room? Okay, alright. So you're going to be testing me as we go through this then. Okay, but there's a few people. Hands up who's not done anything around Kanban at all. Good news is you're definitely all going to learn something by the time you leave here today. Okay. So what is Kanban then? All our people that are the Kanban experts that are using it out there, what is it? A bit of wood. A bit of wood? Okay. Option, yeah? What else is it? Visualization. Visualization? I was going to say visualization of the tasks that need to be done. Visualization? Flow. Flow, absolutely. Flow? It's, uh, it's a flow, but always making sure that you know, it's, it's a pull flow rather than a push flow. Pull system <coughs> rather than a push system. Absolutely. These are all words that are music to my ears. So what is Kanban? So Kanban is a method for catalyzing improvements to service delivery. Now when I say service delivery, that's absolutely everything that you and your teams do every day. So I have to deliver parts of the ASOS website to get the functionality out. That is a service that I provide to ASOS. It doesn't have to be a technical thing. I've done it for marketing campaigns and publishing. It can be absolutely anything. It's not limited to the software industry. And it is a catalyst for driving continuous improvement within your teams and within your organisations. Now I really like this picture because the roots of Kanban come from manufacturing. Okay? So back in the 1950s, just after the war, we've got all of these manufacturing parts, they've got all of these car parts sitting around appreciating in value, costly warehousing, costing them lots of money. So they need to, to try and solve a problem, as in how do they reduce the cost in these? And so some really smart people came together, one of those being Tachiono, and if you're all familiar with Agile, he's actually got history in Agile as well. They came together and started to think about, how can we improve what we do and save ourselves some money? So they introduced Kanban to help them manage the way that they manufacture car parts. So this is a picture taken from Toyota, and this is an actual Kanban system that they have there. And what would happen is, I would be putting <coughs> tyres on cars, you can imagine it, me and my overalls lifting these heavy tyres and putting them on cars, and at some point, I would run out of tyres. And I needed to be able to send a signal to the men that would go and get these tyres for me that I needed some. So what I would do is, I would take my little card, so imagine a 6x4 record card if you like, you're probably all familiar, I'd take my card, I'd say I need some tyres, I would come and put them on the machine, and this man's job would be to replenish those car parts for me. Okay? So that was the first part of the signal of how they use cameras. And this allowed them to reduce the inventory that they have out there in the warehouses, because we could then start to work out how many of these do I need on a daily basis, how many of these do I need on a weekly basis. And they started then to extend that further. And quite often we hear talking about um, Toyota, the just-in-time, just-in-time. So they were able to then work out when they needed to call stuff from the external suppliers to be able to provide me with the car tires. So they started thinking about the system as a whole and how they could actually smooth that way and only have parts that are needed for the demand that they have on their system at the current time. So I know what you're thinking. How did we get from manufacturing to where we are today? So back in early 2000s, about 2004, a guy called David Anderson, he was actually experimenting with some agile practices. And he was getting a little despondent about what he was seeing, what he was hearing, and how he was applying those um, to the organizations that he was working in. And he was actually working in Microsoft at the time. So he started to investigate other methods. So he started getting um, sort of like mailings from 
what's going on over there in Toyota. <coughs> a good friend of his was working over there with them. So he started investigating this more, and he actually stumbled across something called <coughs> drum buffer rope. You can imagine me trying to sell you drum buffer rope today, couldn't you? Yeah? It's just not going to happen. It's not a snappy name. So he originally looked at this, and the reason why they call it drum buffer rope, so drum being the heartbeat, looking for the problem, looking for the challenge. Um, buffer, because we use buffers in Kanban to understand where the problems are. And rope, because it's a pull system, not a push system, and you can't push a rope. So back in early 2000s, he was having a look at how he could apply this to the software industry. And quite often we call this knowledge work because everything we do is in our brains. So he started playing around with this and he was getting you know, some quite significant results. Now Donald Reinertsen, who's quite a well-known author of a book about flow, it's not for the faint-hearted, I will, I will give you that. Um, I've probably only ever got halfway through. But he came over from where they were doing some work in, in Japan and he started to have a look at what David Anderson was doing because they were friends. And he said, David, I actually think you've got a Kanban system. And that's because of how the use of buffers, how the use of flow, the pull mechanisms, and the way that they've used the limits to help them do that. So that's where, back in 2004, Kanban was actually coined in terms of the software industry. And from that point forward, he'd used that in Microsoft and another called, company called Corbis, who produced great results. So the picture that I started off this presentation with, that's taken from the front of his book, and that's the Kanban by David J. Anderson. So who's read that book? So that's a great place where you can go and start getting some knowledge about how this pulls together and how it works and the principles and the guidelines behind it. Now, interestingly, I found out a little fact. I always like to have little facts about things. And when I said to you guys, what is Kanban? A couple of you said, it's about the visualization. Because that's probably what most of us actually associate it being with. But visualization didn't actually come until 2007. Okay, So that's many, many years later. So the original Kanban systems were actually formed as part of the early team foundation server, TFS. And it was all done on spreadsheets. Um, and there wasn't even any pictures. So that wasn't the first thing that drove Kanban. And that's really interesting because you're not alone to think visualisation is the primary part of it. So from there he tried it in lots of different companies. We got some traction and we started to see it grow throughout um, the rest of the time up until the present day. And it is still an evolving method. So some of the things that you know, we talked about 12 months ago, have changed since then. And so it's always worthwhile keeping in check about what the latest um, evolutions of Kanban is. So, oh, I always press the wrong button on this one. So what do we see going on in this road? Total bottleneck. Absolute chaos, isn't it? So if this was our road system in the UK, what would we do to solve this problem? Traffic lights. Traffic lights, yeah. Roundabouts. Especially if you live in Milton Keynes. <laughs> <laughs> passive aggressive tweeting. Yeah. Uh, Possibly. <laughs> passive aggressive tweeting while driving. Congestion charge. Congestion charge. Chevrons. We have chevrons, don't we, to keep people equal distance apart? Pa park and ride. Park and ride. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, because we all love that, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> Remove the bridge. <laughs> <laughs> if you're in Norwich right now, you just make it pedestrianised. <laughs> That's they're doing with everything. But also, on our roads, we're pretty smart because we're getting those electronic boards across the top now, which change the speed limits on the different lanes, don't they? So they've got people, allegedly, watching the roads, uh, seeing what's happening and how it's flowing, and then what they do is they change those limits, don't they? So if you need to slow things down, then they change it to a 50 and if there's go 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 they let you have it at 70. So what they're doing is starting to flex how we behave on the roads. Now typically on our motorways how many lanes are there? Three? Three. Three? Three. Someone down here said four. He's <laughs> not English. <laughs> <laughs> not English? <laughs> exactly right. We have four lanes. We have a hidden lane. 
What's that? Our shoulder. Our shoulder. Our shoulder. So we've got those lovely flashy things going across the top now, and if you watch them, sometimes in heavy traffic and no emergencies, they open up that fourth lane to get things moving. And if someone needs to use that lane for an emergency, what we do is signal, close in, and everyone falls back in line. So absolutely, we're getting super smart at looking at how we behave on our roads and how we can manage that and how we can flex that in times of needs. I mean, other answers that I normally get is, you just make the bridge bigger. Yeah. yeah? So how many times in your projects has someone said to you, you've said, I can't deliver this on time, and they've said to you, just get more resource. Yeah? Is there anyone who's not had that said to them? That's probably an easier question. Okay, because you'd be a total anomaly. My near work more hours. Work more hours. Work harder, work faster, work cheaper. I think Absolutely. the right analogy is getting everyone on the bridge to just go faster and it will be fine. Yeah. Mm. So we can't just expand our capacity that easy because I'm going to have to probably close down this part of the roads. I'm going to have to get funding, planning permission. That could take me a long time. I'm going to have to interview candidates. Oh, I can relate this back to the work world, can't I? Get funding, um, interview candidates. To do that, I'm probably going to have to close down half my team while I look at CVs, which probably aren't as optimal as I'd want them to be. Um, then once they arrive, I've got to train them, which again means... I lose half my team while that's happening. I'm not as I'm not as full capacity as I would like to be. Okay, so just getting bigger is not always the answer. So this is very amusing, but how does this relate to what Kanban physically is? So Kanban is about understanding what the demand of your organisation is. So how much stuff do you have in fly at any given time? How much work do you have going on? It's also about how many people have you got to be able to do that work. So, for example, when I worked at um, Aviva, no one works from Aviva here, do they? Just checking, just checking. <laughs> so, when I worked at Aviva, we would have a multi million pound portfolio of work that needed to be done. And that was in the hundreds of millions, okay? And so, there was us, you know, the, the 20, 30 IT teams trying to deal with all that work. <coughs> And so what they would do on their annual planning cycle, it's very different by the way now, it's very different. On their annual planning cycle, they would push it all into these teams and we would be working on four or five, if we were lucky, different projects at the same time. Which we know is not a good thing because we're all agile practitioners. We know that we need to be focusing on one thing at a time and getting it done. So what we need to be doing is thinking about what is the demand we have on our organisation? And what have we got in the teams to be able to help us to deal with that? Now, increasing capability in organisations, as we know, is not always that easy. So we have to think about how we can flex what we've got to be able to help us to be able to do that work. So Kanban looks at how we can understand what our demand and capacity is and what levers we've got to be able to flex that for when we start to use it. And Kanban is about encouraging flow. So to get this fridge moving, we probably need to take some cars off of it. So we need to limit the stuff that's coming through, work out how many optimally can pass, and then that will get things moving. Just like we do on our roads here in the UK, sometimes excluding bank holidays from the <coughs> okay. So this is what Kanban really is. And quite often I hear it referred to as like methodology, a framework. It's not really any of those things. Kanban is something that you apply on top of the way that you work now. So it's not going to tell you like Scrum that you need to have these roles, you need to do sprint planning, refinement, reviews, retrospectives and daily stand-ups. It's not going to tell you all of those things. So in Kanban, we respect the fact that your organisation has got to a point after maybe, like Aviva, hundreds of years. And so we value the fact that there's some processes and some of them are good and some of them maybe need a little bit of help. So what we do is we apply the method of Kanban on top of that using the principles and practices to help us guide the way that we want to move forward. Now quite often you might hear the word scrum ban used, okay? And scrum ban really is an evolutionary or transitionary straight from scrum to moving to a Kanban way. But you can move directly from waterfall through to a Kanban way of working as well. So what are these mysterious principles and practices that I've been telling you about. And you can ask me questions at any time, by the way, but I might just put you on hold until we get to that point in the day. So there's, set, there's two sets of principles 
Actually, there's three sets of principles, but I'm only going to cover two of them today. So the first two look at service and change, and the third looks at scaling. I think scaling is something that we talk about in Kanban another day. So the first set of principles are, understand and focus on your customer needs and expectations. So what is it that our customers want? Manage the work and let people organise around it. This one, these words aren't mine, these are David Anderson's, and so this one's a little bit of a mouthful. Mm -hmm. Your organisation is an ecosystem of independent services steered by its policies, reflecting regularly on their effectiveness and improve on them. <gasps> okay, so what does that mean? So, the way that we work, we have multiple different teams delivering. Now, in Scrum, we often talk about feature teams, and I'm going to make the assumption that you guys know what a feature team is. You bring people together to be able to deliver something to end to end without having to go off to different teams. But quite often when you pick up teams from waterfall organisations, they have what we call component teams. And these are teams that are based mainly around like a system or um, a product that they've got. It can be absolutely anything. So Kanban doesn't dic Sorry, was there a question? No, just noise, okay. So Kanban <laughs> doesn't dictate that you have to have feature teams. You can do this directly from component-based teams. But it's about how you hook these teams together. So Kanban is more than just team Kanban. It will work very well in your team, but here it talks about your organization being interdependent systems, so teams that work together to deliver an overall service from concept through to cash and how you do that. Okay, so this is what this bottom one is about. Now these are the ones that you're probably more familiar with. Okay, so the change management principles. So the first principle of Kanban is, you start with what you do now. Remember, we respect the history that your organization's got, and we want to have a look to see how you are working. Now, we're going to understand current processes as they're actually practiced, and we're going to respect existing roles, responsibilities, and job titles. So, a little bit unlike Scrum, when they came into Aviva to work with us, these, these consultants that I have to work for now, um, when they came in, they said, oh, you don't need your project managers anymore, you just need scrum masters. Um, you don't need BAs anymore, you just need product owners. And that can be, actually be quite shocking to an organisation, and that's what makes change so hard with people. So, we don't want to make that change hard with Kanban, so we want to come in and understand how you're working, and then we want to find out what are the biggest problems that we have to solve, and then they're the things that we start solving. Now, we're going to agree to pursue improvement through evolutionary change. So we're going to find a thing, fix it, move on to the next. Find it, fix it, find it, fix it. We're not going to go big bang change. We're going to evolve your current and existing thing. And we're going to need to encourage active leadership at all levels. So you guys are going to be empowered to speak up and talk about the problems and go out there and solve them. But you need that at ground all the way up to senior level to make sure that we've got the right level of authority to make those things happen. Okay. So a little bit like Scrum, it's about an empirical process in finding out what's working and what isn't working. So there's some values that go along with this. There's leadership, agreement, respect and understanding. Now, <coughs> there are some practices of Kanban, and this is what we're going to spend a little bit more time going through. So what's the first practice of Kanban? My Kanban experts, what is it? Oh, you're all a little bit shy now, aren't you? Visualise. Okay? So the first thing we need to do is make the work extremely visible, and we do that through building our Kanban systems on the board. Now, you probably noticed that I always use the word Kanban system, okay? Because what we're thinking about is the whole process end to end rather than just sticky post it notes on the board. So I'll always refer to it as a Kanban system. Uh, earlier you said that visualization wasn't always. Uh, Back in 2000, 2004, there was no visualization, it was done in a spreadsheet. Right. So it was, back, it was in 2007 when they started using it within um, Corvus, they delivered a huge project, and that's the one that's listed in the blue book. Somebody then said, and the guy's <coughs> name is actually Daniel Vacanti, he said, oh, why don't we put this on the wall? 
revolutionary. And so that's actually how the visualization came about. Okay, so Scrum came about in 1994, so they probably got some um, encouragement from the way that they did it. So when you say it's in spreadsheet, do you literally mean like goes from tab to tab or? I, I, don't, I don't know I'm physically. I've, I've, never, I've never seen it, okay. but they managed it using spreadsheets. Okay. I reckon that's a question for one of the guys that were originally there. How come the visualization has been part of the new manufacturing effort for yeah. decades now? Yep. How come it was, it was messed up? You know, it's, it's very fundamental to. I know. This is why I say it's an interesting fact. How was it not there from the start? But that's it. I don't know the. You know the, the full story there and why they didn't use it and things like that. I can ask David next time I see him, but it didn't come about until 2007. So visualization now is a key thing to help us to understand and help us to manage the work. Now the second one is limiting work in progress. And so what this one looks at is understanding the capacity of the system or the team or the service that you particularly have um, that you're working with. Now Quite often I walk into companies and they say to me, oh yeah, we're a Kanban team. And they walk me over and I go have a look at the wall and I'm partial to a post-it note, so I'm always really pleased to see lovely colourful post-it notes on the wall. Not sponsored by 3M in any way. <laughs> so I love it, but what I'm not seeing is a Kanban system. What I see is a visual management system using post-it notes as indicators of the work. Now, if you're going to call yourself a Kanban system, then you have to do these two things. You have to understand what your demand and your capacity is, and then you have to limit that through the use of wood fluids, Okay, So you have to do those two things. If I'm going to be brutal, that's what makes a Kanban system. Okay? Now, the other practices you apply then to these, and however many practices you apply, that's of your, the depth of your Kanban implementation. So if you just did these two things, it's actually quite shallow. And what we tend to do is call this proto-Kanban. There's still absolute value in visualization, absolutely, 100% I'm behind that. But you need to have these two things. Now the third one is managing the flow. So in Kanban, we don't have the concept of a two-week sprint. We just keep working, we just keep working. There's no cadence, there's no time box, whatever word you use. So we need to have ways to understand how we're doing, if there's problems, and then gives us an opportunity to solve those. So I'll show you how we do some of that in a moment. Then we need to make emergencies explicit. So who has a definition of done here? It's reassuring, okay. So definition of done is basically explicit policies within Kanban. So this is about calling out all of those good things that need to be done and need to be remembered and make them really, really clear on your visualisation. So the next one, implementing feedback loops. Who does retrospectives here? Okay, more hands, more popular than the definition of done. Okay, so that's good. So think of these as your retrospectives. How are we going to improve what we do? Do you remember I said it's about catalyzing improvement within your organization and within your teams? So how do we do that within a Kanban way? Now the final one, which is linked to the feedback loops, is improve collaboratively, evolve experimentally using models and scientific method. So these are linked because we want to find out what's going on and what it is that we need to change to improve, but we want to use models and scientific method to do so. So this is simply, make a final problem, make a hypothesis about what you're going to fix and what you think is going to change, set those goals, make those changes, and then measure it at a later point in time. Okay? And you can use different models to help you do that. So again, when we go through these in a little bit more detail, I will show you some of those. Now linked to these, we've also got values of customer focus, transparency, balance, collaboration, and flow. Okay, make sense so far? Everyone still with me? Balance. So balance, this is about thinking within your teams, have we got the right blend of people to be able to move work through that system? Okay. So let's take a look at the first practice in a little bit more detail. Now visualisation. So 
When I often go into companies, they expect me to go in there and say, Ta da here is your Kanban board, this is what you'll be moving from using from this point forward. Okay? So think back to my first principle. Start with what you do now. Every single Kanban system will be completely different because organisations work in different ways and it's not just IT, it's absolutely anything. So they are all different and we have to work out what that looks like. Now we won't go through it today, but that exercise is something called the Systems Thinking Approach to Implementing Kanban, or if you want to remember it, it's called STATIC. Okay, STATIC, the Systems Thinking Approach to Implementing Kanban. And it lays out a number of steps on how you get to the point where you have your visualization, and going through STATIC also helps you to work out what your demand and what your capacity is within your organization. But, alas, I have an hour, and so I'm keeping it brief. But, if I had to make a really good guess what a typical IT software board would look like, it'll probably look a little something like this. So let's have a look at some of the components that I've physically got on here. Now I've got a number of columns, and we call these state columns, okay? Now sometimes these columns are split into two. So what do we class this as? A buffer, okay? Now the reason why we have buffers on our Kanban systems is because we use these to highlight where there are problems, okay? Now what I mean is, I've got some developers working on a feature here and in progress and they tell me it's ready to test. But maybe I've got 10 developers and I've got two testers. And so what happens is work will build up here. It will effectively queue. And things that queue are waiting around and costing us money. So we need to identify where these queues, where these bottlenecks are, and then we need to find a way to sort that out. And that might be balancing the system, thinking about our processes in terms of automation, or it might be in, I've got 10 developers and I've only got two testers, maybe I need to do something around that. So we have buffers on our boards to help us to understand where the problems are. If you were in a true flow system, you wouldn't need buffers, but I've not actually found one of those yet, so one day I will. Okay? But until then, they're a really good thing to have on your board. Now another thing we have is lines that go this way. So sometimes you hear them referred to as swim lanes, but in some of the tooling nowadays, they call these swim lanes. So it's getting a little bit confusing. So we've changed the language slightly to say that these are now rows. Makes sense, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Which tool says swim lane? I don't, I don't know. Jerry's the swim lane. Jerry's the swim lane. Which one? Do they? I don't know. I was told, do not use that word. Okay. So sometimes they're swim lanes, but they're roads now. Okay. So what might you do with these different swim lanes? So you might use this to help you visualise the different work that you've got. So you might have top one, it's really important stuff, the emergencies, holy crap, we need to do this now, okay? So we might have that top line for that. Then you might have all your features, your stuff that you're going to work on here. Then you might have incidents, so you might have incidents there. Um, when I was at uh, HP, um, we were using this on their Agile Manager tool. Interestingly, we were using Kanban on the Agile Manager tool. Um, they had kind of like the latest version here because this is the most important one that they wanted to work on and they had later versions lower down on the board because they were less important because they were working them out of the organisation. So you can use these to represent really whatever you want. It's about managing the work. So do we think that having swim lanes for people are a good thing or a bad thing? If it works. <laughs> Political answer there. Yeah. If it works. Can be a good okay. answer if it depends. So, if that's what you do now, first principle, you start mm. with what you do now. But the reason why we don't advocate that is because what you want to happen on this board, you want everybody to work together and have a holistic view about what's going on. Because you want these guys to go and help these guys and vice versa if there's problems. So what I've found is where you have teams that have um, people on their swim lanes, um, they sub-optimise and they just work on their bit and screw anyone else because I'm going to get my work over to the other side. Okay? Maybe not everybody's like that. 
But some of the teams that I found do do that. So we try and discourage that, but you kind of have to work that out for yourself sometimes. So we use swim lanes to help us to manage the work. So here you can see at the top, I've got my width limits. Um, and these are going to help me to understand how many cards I can have in fly at any given point in time. Now, this number will stretch over both your column, state column, and your buffer. Why do we think that is? <coughs> Say again? Limit. Yes, we want to limit it. And the reason why we want to limit it is because if there was no limit on this bit here, the developers would just keep developing, wouldn't they? Yeah? They don't screw the testers, they're just going to keep developing because that's what we want to do. Okay? Not stereotyping anyone in any way, shape, or form. So if we put a buffer that includes that, it means they can't pull any more work in, so they have to think, oh, well, how do I get rid of that? I get rid of that by helping those people to allow more capacity in. Okay? So we use these numbers to help create it to be a pull system rather than a push. And that's why we buffer both the so that's why we whip both the buffer and the state column. Now at the top here, I've got my explicit policies. And policies can be on the boundaries, it can be on the type of work, um, it can be on the swim lanes, but ultimately it will tell the team or the organisation how we're expecting to work. So sometimes, I love the definition of done, but sometimes it's just written on a bit of paper and it's just never ever looked at again. Whereas in Kanban, I tend to kind of like have them all over here on the boundaries and so I then give them a little test every now and again and say, well, did this meet all of those things? Okay, so you're making it really obvious. Because we don't fix a team in Kanban, people can come and join as they, as they wish. You need to be allowed to have somebody walk up to your board and understand how you work as a unit to produce that value at the other end. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit more about policies. How do you determine what numbers should be dictated on the Hold that thought. We'll do that when we get to the second practice. Now here you can see I've got a number of different features. Avatars are quite common practice these days, aren't they? Blockers, if there's a problem. Um, the other thing to note about Kanban is these are one-way systems. Okay, So everything will move in one direction. I do hit lick. Okay. So what I don't want to do is have a ticket here and think, oh, I've got a defect on it and I'm going to move it back to development. If you've got a purely physical board, there is nothing stopping you doing that. But Kanban is very data-centric. And so if you do that when you've got an electronic tool, that will screw your data up and it becomes a problem. Okay, And I've learned that the hard way. So keep things moving in one direction. So when I have a defect of something that's currently in test, I will create a separate sticker, I'll send it back, and it won't be worked on until my developers have the capacity to be able to pull that piece of work in. Okay? And also it gives me an opportunity for my product owner, product manager, and your word here, to make a choice about it. Yeah? Well that's a very important thing. <coughs> you want your developers to drop whatever they're doing to fix that thing in, that thing in test. Mm -hmm. How do you how do you manage that? What do you think you'd do? What do you do now? Do now, I uh, stop, stop you what they're doing and get this done if that's what if that's what's required. You'd have a conversation, wouldn't you? Yeah. Yeah. yeah you'd have a conversation about it. If it's just changing colour from pink to blue, probably could wait. If it's like, oh my god, this is stopping us from using the things that we need to do, it's probably going to be quite reactive. But ultimately, it's a conversation to say. We need to fix this now. So just to clarify, you said if there's a problem in test that requires development, you'd encourage the user to bring it back into development? No. I would create a separate ticket for that defect, right. um, or if they want to collaborate there and then, but if it needs to go back onto the backlog or be queued up for a developer, then I would push it back through the system as a separate ticket. And then what will happen is it will meet up finally with this one here and it will just become part of this. Okay, so you keep things moving one way. Now that's important because when we do our daily stand-up in Kanban, what we do is we work from right to left. And we do that because on this side is where all of the value is. The value is not in starting pieces of work. The value is in finishing pieces of work. So everything from test onwards is money and effort that we've spent developing 
and actually it's in our interest to get these things out of the door. So rather than starting something new, I want to be focusing on finishing the things that we've got on this board. And so our mantra in Kanban is, Vlad? The sooner you finish, the sooner you finish. The sooner you finish. It's my favourite thing. <laughs> I work with Vlad and he comes to these. He could probably do this himself. So the sooner you finish, the sooner you finish. So in our stand-up, what we do is we say, what does it take to get this out the door? How do we deploy it? What do we need to do to get this review, get it out of the door? So we work this way, and we go through each card until we understand how we can get those all out. And if we've got some people that still have some capacity to do something, then we agree that we're going to pull more work into the system and start working on it. Okay? Now, some of these things I'm telling you, you can actually apply to your Scrum teams tomorrow. Okay? So think about how you can actually start getting some value from these practices as well. Sometimes that's called walk the board in Scrum, but in Kanban you're starting it from the right to left because that's where the value is. Now, I've got some other things on here. What am I doing for time? Oh, I'm behind. I am behind. Okay, so other things I've got over here is I've got confirmation. So I put this on here because I wanted to validate um, that what we've delivered is valuable. Okay, so that was a little learning I had. One of the teams. Um, they were just delivering and delivering and delivering and everything was awesome apparently but when I went and spoke to the business we're not using any of these features because it's not what we wanted and the product owner product manager was driving their own ambitions not what the customers wanted so for one particular team I put this on because I wanted them to physically go and sit down and get that feedback from the business that it's valuable now other things I've got abandoned so it's important that if stuff gets abandoned I understand what that is, and that's because it costs me money. And so if I've got a high abandonment rate, why? What can we do about that? Now also, sometimes in this system, especially in application support teams, I'm gonna have stuff waiting because I need information or I'm waiting for a third party to bring me stuff, okay? So what will happen is, I can leave it in here, this is one option, option A, you can leave it in here, but this will become quite clogged up, okay? So sometimes you have to just move it out of proximity of the board to allow things to continue. But actually this is a really bad thing to do, to have one of these, because you're kind of then accepting that there's a problem. So if you have one of these, you have to recognise, you have to solve why things are waiting so long. Maybe you need to renegotiate how long it takes you to get a server, or how people respond back to you and how long they have before you put it back onto the queue. Okay. So this is a good idea. But it's a bit of an anti-pattern because it's a problem that you have to solve. Now, other things you might have on your board, you might have different classes of service. Okay? And this, again, tells us how work is going to behave. So we might have an expedite. Oh, my God, we can no longer take credit card. We have to do this, fix this now. Expedite, do it. Um, you might have a fixed date. So in ASOS, we have to hit certain sale periods. And if we miss that, we're doomed. Okay? So fixed date, we have to do by a certain point in time. Then you've got standard. So the cost of delay on this is kind of like grows at a linear level. Okay, So as and when do we get round to doing it. So that's our standard work. And then you have intangibles. So think of these as could be your process improvements. They could also be maybe that new funky thing in ASOS that they want to try, but they don't really understand how much money we could make from this or if people even really want it. And so we build it as a, like a lean idea, put it out there and get that feedback. So it's something that we don't understand the cost of delay on not doing. Okay. Now, this is just one way. As long as you remember the principles of everything moves, you have work in progress limits, you have some of these core components, whether you use swim lanes, coloured post-it notes, you have your waiting here, your waiting there, it's really up to you to decide, and with the team, the best way to manage this stuff. So you have your physical construct of the board, but you also have tickets designs. So you can have different colours, you can have check boxes to say what's required and what's completed. You can say things of the high and important, shapes and decorators, start dates, end dates, or you can cross off the boxes, or you can put dots on. These are all interesting ways to find out how long these tickets have physically been in flight. Okay? So think about what you can do to be creative with those.
<clears throat> now the second one is limiting your work in progress. So these are the numbers that we've got in the top. So how do we set these? First of all, why do we set these? So we want to encourage people working together, so swarming. If you're working in a scrum, you probably know the concept of that. Getting stuff out the door, the sooner you finish, the sooner you finish. We want work to flow, so whip limits help us to flow work through that we have capacity to do. It helps you become a pull system. It helps you to focus on smaller items of work, because if you have big pieces of work that sit there for long periods of time, you're not going to see new things moving across. It's going to focus on finishing work items, and it's going to help us to balance the board in terms of the capacity that we've physically got. So we need to stop our teams from multitasking on different things and get them to focus on finishing those one things at a time. So that's why we limit women. Now, there's a couple of ways that you can actually work out what your whip limits are. Now, the first most complicated way is Little's Law. Okay? So I'm not going to go into this in massive details, but I'm going to tell you the relationship. Okay? Now, as Little's Law talks about work in progress over your delivery rate, equals your lead time. So using this, I can say with confidence, if my work in progress limit stays the same, and I improve my lead time, so I improve the process and the way that the team works, I will improve how much stuff they get completed on whatever rhythm you want to have it done. Okay. Now I know if I don't improve anything, if I keep my lead time the same, the lead time being how long it takes to get stuff from one side of the board to the other side of the board. Um, so if I keep that the same, but I want to improve my delivery rate, I have to change this factor here. Okay, so again, it's telling me that relationship. But with the whip, if you want to increase it, you have to add more people. If you don't add more people, then your delivery rate will actually suffer. And so this is why sometimes when you throw more people at it, it doesn't always have that positive effect. It can actually reduce the delivery rate in the way that you're working. So how can you use this to set your work in progress limits? If you know how long it takes you to do things, so you might have value stream mapped it. If you understand how long it takes you to do things, and if you have a date in mind when you want something delivered by, you can work out what your delivery rate would need to be to get there. You can work out what your whip limit would need to be. So you would then take your 10 and you would need to distribute it across your board. Okay? So you could use that if you have a fixed state in mind to help you to do that. Probably the easiest way, so in my professional opinion, how should we do this? We guess. Okay? So what we do is we think about who we've got in our team. Now, you would think that one person can work on one thing at a time, so a whip of one to one would probably be the best. But actually, quite often, I'm waiting for people to come back to me on things. So normally you find the optimal whip limit is one person to two pieces of work. I'm working on something whilst I'm waiting on something. So what I might say is, to keep the math simple, if I've got five developers, I've got a whip of 10, so I can take in 10 pieces of stuff for them to be able to complete. Now there's some exceptions, there's always exceptions, and that is, if I'm in an application support team, they might have real high numbers of incidents that they're dealing with, and actually they are waiting for lots of information to come back. So I might increase that whip limit to five per one person, but I would be working out how I could reduce that to a more manageable number through process improvement. So what we do is, using that, we have a guess about what our whip limits are and how they should be distributed, and then we just watch to see what happens. And quite often I say, play the board. See where you're bottlenecking, see where the problem points are, and then reduce them gradually over time to help things start flowing more easily. Okay, look to see how they're doing. Now, practice three is about managing your flow. Now, because we don't have time boxes, we have to get an idea about what is happening. <coughs> Who knows what this is? Cumulative flow. flow. Yeah. So this is really good in Scrum as well as Kanban. But what this tells me is 
Oh, well, it doesn't tell me the exact answer. It gives me an indication that there's a problem. Now, depending on how many <coughs> columns you have on your Kanban system, it will depend on how many rows you have on your cumulative flow diagram. So here, in this example, I can see that the to-do is yellow, so I can see how my queue is growing. I can see how much stuff is in design. I can see how much stuff is in build, test, and done. So obviously, this is quite good because my work coming in and my work going out is at quite a linear rate. So that's, a, that's an optimal CFD to have a look for. Not always like that. What you can then do is, where they start to get bigger, you can see that there's actual problems. So the distance between these lines is what your whip limit is. So if I've got a whip of two, then this row should be two, using the key, all the way across that. So if you start to see it expanding, it means people have taken on more work, and therefore we need to investigate why they're doing that. It's probably a blocker. So you can see that they're not straight, and typically they're not the real ones that you use. It doesn't tell you exactly what it is, but it's a signal that you need to go and find out and have a talk to the team. Now, because I know that the distance between these lines is my whip, it's fair to say that the distance from here to here is my total whip on the board. And it's fair to say that the distance from here to here, so how long something is taking for me to do at this point, across the bottom, the number of dates, that's my average lead time. So I can actually plug the measures <coughs> law at any time using this chart to help me to understand what the delivery rate of my team is. And I can see if it's got better or I can see if it's got worse based upon how much stuff we've got in flight and how long it's taking us to do. So again, that's something that you can have a look at in terms of Scrum as well as Kanban. Isn't there a slight risk there then? Because <coughs> Mitchell's law there's key assumptions that need to be met. As in not, I won't be correct if I'm wrong, but I've never thought that cumulative flowcharts actually give you, shows you whether you can actually meet those assumptions. It's, like it's your average. Is the average age the of average. growing? Yeah. So Little's Law is useful, and the assumptions are that work arrives roughly at the same time that it leaves, and you don't have things sitting around for long periods of time. So you're probably less likely to use Little's Law in the early stages of transition to Kanban because you're going to have a lot of flux in your board and how you work and processes and things like that. So the more stable you get, the more effective the use of Little's Law will physically be. So there's a good video, if you're interested in that, by Dan Picanti, and it's called Little's Floor, um, which talks about you know what you have to consider if you use it. Now this is... Lots more people working on the same problem delivers faster. Um, I suppose you mentioned that already in reducing the number of active products. Do you have anything towards that? Uh, no, I, I completely advocate more programming. So that's just kind of a different way of swarming on work and getting it done and making sure that the quality is high, isn't it? So I, I don't think it's when here we look at lead time, how long it takes to do, not how many people are working on it. So if you need your whole whip of five to be working on one thing, so be it. Shouldn't that reduce the whip? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, absolutely. So other charts that you have is um, something called your lead time distribution chart. So we use this to collect how long things are physically taking us to do things. So you can see here, card count, and then I've got lead time across the bottom. Remember, lead time is the start point to the end point. Now, here, I can see that I've got um, a lead time of two days. I've got about six cards that were delivered then. A lead time of four days. Um, I've got about 16 of those. So I start to collect up data, which looks at what is my delivery frequency of the stuff that we're doing. Now, again, this is probably a little bit more of an advanced topic, but what you can then do is use different types of distribution curves to help you to understand something called the 85th percentile. Now, typically, in organisations, we use a bell curve distribution, and we use the median. So, what's the average it takes us to do something? But when we talk in those terms, you're talking 50%. Um, right now, you probably have got a 50% chance of getting out of here at 8 o'clock, okay? <laughs> but actually...
actually a better message would be you've got an 85% chance of getting out here at 8 o'clock and if you were your customer you would probably want that kind of reassurance that stability so a guy called Troy McGinnis he's run thousands and thousands and thousands of models from the software industry and he knows and I don't understand how he does this myself but I trust him that he tells me that the distributions that we see within organisations are something called a viable distribution. And it looks a little something like this. Okay? And I didn't do this scientifically, I just drawed it on for the sake of this class. Okay? And it looks a little something like this, and we can then work out 85% of the time I can deliver stuff to you in 12 days or less. So if your piece of work gets to the top of the queue, you know you're going to get it in 12 days or less. If you've got less tolerance to risk, you might say you're 95th percentile. Or if they want to know a full range, you might go from 75th through to 95th. Okay? So it changes. And this is probably why you've heard like the hashtag no es estimates in Kanban, because they don't necessarily have estimates. What they do is they look at how long stuff takes to get done and they use that to then plan and forecast their work. Um, there is value in having the conversation when it comes to estimates, but we know that estimates, they're kind of like out, and they're not accurate. So we use real data to work out how long stuff is going to take us to get done based on trends and patterns and distributions that we know fit our industry. That's a really difficult transition to make. Yeah, definitely. So if you're interested in this, Troy McGinnis. Isn't that on the basis that all kind of work is similar? Mm. Yeah, all your tasks are the same. Okay. Or in a range. I'm gonna I'm gonna pause that because <laughs> I am on a deadline, but we can talk about that after if you want. Okay. Now you've also got a process control chart which maps the exact same data and it looks at what's inside and outside of control. So everything in the middle is good. Things that are above and below, we need to have a conversation about to see what the problems are. Why did it? Why was it so quick? Why was it so slow? What can we do to either replicate or speed it up? Okay, so another way of looking at this. This looks like it came out of a tool. What tool was it? This comes from Lean Kit. All these charts are from Lean Kit so far. Now you also have flow efficiency, um, which is a way that you can look at how the flow is happening across the board. And what it does is it looks at touch time. So how long do we spend working on things versus how long does it spend waiting in queues or for somebody to pick it up? And you can do a calculation to work out how efficient, flow efficient that team is. But I would be really careful because typically the numbers are between 1% and 5%. If you go and tell your CEO that, yeah, we're only 5% flow efficient, that might cause some alarm. Okay? So just be mindful of that. Typically, you might see them around 20%. If you get 40%, you're pretty good, okay? So if you're gonna use it, message it. So again, flow efficiency is another set of data that helps us to manage flow and how we're doing things. Waste, so lean, so Kanban comes from the <coughs> lean family. So we also look at what can we reduce in terms of wastefulness to help us to do what we need to do. So Mary and Tom Poppendike talk about the seven categories of, of um, waste. So defects, handoffs, relearning, there's lots of them. Kanban talks about three. It talks about trans transaction cost. So think of this as, this weekend I'm going to paint my fence. The transaction cost is me going to B&Q and buying the paint and then me cleaning the brushes at the end. The value is in me actually delivering the panels. Coordination cost, um, me when I was delivering some training over Skype to um, Manila the other day, the coordination cost was the 30 minutes I had to wait for Skype to actually recognise everybody was online and then show the slides that I was doing. Failure load is things that go through your system but have to come back because there's a problem. Okay? So these are the things that you want to identify as well and try and remove these to help you keep flowing in the way that you're working. Now, you think that's quite a good example of... Uh and transferring it to Manila because that's the reality that you have to do this. Yeah, absolutely. So it's eight o'clock. Is everybody all right? I've only got uh, three more practice, four, five, no, two practices left after this one. Are we all all right? Yeah. Okay, keep with me. <coughs> so practice four is make your policies explicit. Call these all out all over your board. 
at the boundaries that you move, how you want types of work to behave, how you want working columns to behave. You might have a team ethos in the way that your team wants to work together. Um, ultimately, what you need to do though, like your definition of done, you need to make them visible, but you need to make sure they're discussed with everybody who's going to be using them. You need to agree them, you need to document them and keep them visible, and you need to review them regularly. So typically I review them every three months as a formal practice or every time that I actually change the type of work that I'm, I'm doing. So maybe I've been doing Kanban and projects and now I'm going into maybe more support, I might change my policies based around that. But ultimately what you want to be doing is keeping them nice and fresh and make sure they're valuable. In the same way that you have a new definition of done, you want to try and make them measurable. So 100% of tests passed, 100% code coverage, documentation that you need to have, you know, all of those things, they would come out as part of your definition of done and your explicit policies. Okay? Now the fifth practice is about feedback. So what ways have we got feedback in our teams at the moment? <coughs> Code review, retrospectives, stand up, reviews, absolutely, all of these things are feedback loops. And we definitely need to be making sure that we're getting regular feedback. So in teams, we will definitely have the board. And I encourage the team to step back and have a look at the board every now and again and see what's going on. And now you'll start to see patterns forming or you'll maybe you'll notice more that you've got bottlenecks or starvation where there's big um, areas of nothingness because nobody's got any work on the board. So your Kanban system is a great place to get some feedback. You've obviously got your Kanban meeting, daily stand-up, um, you've got ad hoc retrospection, so if something's not going quite so well you'd huddle the team and you'd talk about it and then you'd come up with some actions. Um, you've also got um, normal retrospectives, so definitely I completely advocate still having those in Kanban. Kanban doesn't tell you to do them, it tells you to have feedback loops. Okay? So it, it tries to encourage constant feedback within teams to try and you know, get things improved. But we know when we implement Scrum that your team probably isn't used to that and so you need to have some mechanism to get them talking. So having a regular daily um, retrospective every two weeks, I totally still advocate that happening. Do you do you recommend every two weeks or something like that specifically or the other way of setting my patterns? It's really up to you. So when I say two weeks, that's personal opinion based upon what I've seen happen in teams. If I go three weeks, then we start to lose the things that we want to talk about. So if I had three weeks, maybe I'd have something on the board where people would have to put post-it notes as and when things happen so we didn't forget them. The longer you leave them, the chances are the less you'll be able to react to them. So. Two weeks is just my personal preference, it's completely up to you. But I would never recommend four weeks because so much happens in that time. We tried a rule that we never have a retrospective before something was fixed from the previous one. And that worked really nicely. So sometimes we did them more regularly than two weeks, more sometimes a little bit later, but it meant that it always was relevant because people felt that something was fixed. Well, Millie, all teams are different and you have to work out what's going to be fit for them. As Scrum Masters or uh, flow masters or service delivery managers, whatever we call ourselves in Kanban, we've got a responsibility to make sure that we are improving. And however we do that, what frequency and whatever method, it's really up to what's the most conducive thing with your team. Would you set that during the initial static period? Um, probably not during static, but I'd make it a policy. A policy is that we're going to have a retrospective every two weeks. So we've also got chart data, um, which we talked about super briefly in Manage Flow. Um, so that's going to also be a great place for me to have a look at. Now you've also got managers and coaches and other scrum masters within your organisations. And so they're going to be help you to give feedback and provide encouraged leadership and self-organisation. And they're going to look for opportunities. Um, and they're going to help you to focus and grow. You've also got things between teams. So cross-team working groups. So ASOS, we have like a community of practice where we all come together, we all learn, we all look at each other's problems, we all help each other solve these things. And that's a great way to cross-pollinate different ideas from different ways of working. Um, a great book about community of practices was written by a lady called Emily Weber. 
Emily Weber. So it's quite thin, it's quite easy to read. Um, so if it's something that you're interested in, how setting those up and how they can be valuable to your organisation, definitely have a look at that. Um, so think about how you can share ideas across the organisation, but don't expect everything to always work. Example being, everybody loves the Spotify model, don't they? Mm -hmm. So quite often I say, well, we just want to do, uh, well, not say I hear, well, we just want to do that. Oh, but then that doesn't work in our company. Because everybody's different. You have to try and learn for yourself. And finally, your product managers, product owners, and the word here that you use in your organisation, um, they're going to give you feedback in terms of when they're signing off or reviewing pieces of work. Um, you might when you first start out with Kanban, still have a fixed review cadence because you start with what you do now. But ultimately, at some point in the future, you will want to get those pieces of work reviewed as and when they're done. Stop, you know, it getting on because you want to get it out of the door. So you might move from a fixed two-week rhythm to something a little bit more ad hoc. Okay. Now the final one is practice six, which is improve. Um, collaboratively using scientific models and methods. So whatever you do in your retrospectives or your ad hoc perspective, you know, you decide what you're going to change and how you're going to change it. And you do that as a team and as an organisation. Now we collect lots of data and that's why it's quite handy to do these types of things in an electronic system. Quite often I have both because I like the physical aspect of a board, but sometimes it's easier for me to collect data in a tool like TFS, Jira or whatever ones happen to be out there. Now because I am going to be collecting things like lead times and flow efficiencies, these tools will do that for me. So that's a really helpful thing. But I've got other things that I can use to help me set my hypothesis. So my favourite one that I most likely use is A3 Thinking, so from Toyota. Who's heard of A3 Thinking? Yeah? So you can download this for free, no cost involved. So what's the theme, what's the background of the problem, what are the current conditions, what's the root cause analysis, what do you need to do about it, what are your steps and then how are you going to measure it. So that's a scientific model and helping you get to the point where you can measure if what you've done is an improvement. So systems thinking, they use plan, do, check, act. Um, you've also got find, measure, analyse, improve, control. I always forget where that comes from. Six Sigma? Sigma six six sigma? Yeah. Yeah. Sigma? I always forget that one. You've also got process of ongoing improvement. I always remember that one because poogie is such a cute word. Um, so that's another one you can use. Um, Agile has inspect and adapt, probably a bit looser in the scientific method. Um, and you can also then build Kanban, discovery Kanban boards around um, taking some of these and then measuring them and seeing them all the way through so you know what improvements you've got in flight and what improvements you haven't got in flight. Okay? So we don't advocate any particular one. A3 thinking is probably my favourite because it's easy and I can give a sheet of paper and we can all brainstorm and then I can stick it on the wall after we've done. Okay? So investigate the one that works best for the way that your team wants to work. But ultimately, you have to know what you're changing and understand how you're going to change it and how you're going to measure it. Otherwise, what's the point investing in the time in it if you don't think it's going to be beneficial, cost versus value? Okay. So that is practice six. So ultimately, whatever happens, the way you start and the way that you end or you keep running with your team is going to be completely different. It's a continuous evolution in improving the way that you work until you hit something that is suitable for your organisation. So your board is going to change, your opinions on how you work is going to change, your policies are going to change, and that's all really, really good. But because things will change, probably build your boards with string because it's much easier than tape when you're going to be changing it so frequently. And then you'll find what your actual rhythm is, how you want to work, and then that's the way that you'll drive forward until there's something else that you need to improve. So take what you've got now, apply Kanban on top of it. You can apply this and some of the practices on top of your Scrum teams tomorrow and have a think about them, and then see how they can physically help you. Now, if you want more information, 
the Lean Kanban University website is a great place to go. So you can get some information on there. And what I also like about that website is they have um, uh, case studies of how organisations have implemented Kanban and they're actually written by a professional journalist, so they're pretty good. Um, so that's a great place to get some insight into how other places have done it. You've also got Kanban Communities, Limited Whip is another meetup group in London, run by Nada, um, my one, and you've also got groups within Kanban Dev, Kanban, and Yahoo groups, very sort of like quite chatty forums, or you can actually go onto Twitter and speak to a whole heap of people and we'll pretty much always respond to you, okay? And whilst I failed on my time box tonight by 11 minutes, damn it, it's because I took questions. Okay, because I <laughs> so I have rushed through some of these things. Okay, so if you are interested in learning a little bit more in a lot more detail, then shameless plug now, people. Um, I do have some classes coming up in London, and I'm happy to talk to you about those if it's something that you're interested in. Um, I do believe in game theory, so my classes are very game orientated to um, really hammer home concepts that I've been talking to you about and also in the class the second day it's about building the visualization for your team so I'm not going to stand and talk at you I'm going to tell you about building boards then you'll build your board on the walls then I'll tell you how to do whip then we'll sit down and talk about what the whips for your teams should be okay so it's a very interactive class plug over do you make the slides available? Yes, what I'll do is I'll put them into the meetup group um, and then you can access them there. Now, um, I have done this meetup, several, this talk several times before on time, people. Um, and there is a video. So if you did want to share the video or watch it at a later point in time, I'll put the link in there and then you've got that and you can share it with your friends, family, colleagues, children, all of those, all of those interesting people. Now there are some good books, final slide I promise, Kanban, the original book by David Anderson, Scrumban if you want to read a little bit more about that transitionary state by Corey Laddis, um, probably the more recent book, Kanban from the Inside by Mike Burroughs, really talks about the history and how theory of constraints and Toyota influenced the Kanban method, so that's got a real big background in there. Recently, the Lean Kanban University um, produced the Essential Kanban Guides, and this is free. You can go onto that website and you can download it. It's really short and you can read it, and again, you can give it to your managers, your friends and your family. And um, it's something that will give you <coughs> insights into what the method is about. And this book here, I didn't touch on it tonight, but this is a great book. Um, in Kanban, the roots really are um, manufacturing and theory of constraints. Theory of constraints is about understanding where your biggest problems are within your organisations and solving them. Okay? And there's steps that you do around that. This book, um, The Goal, has anyone read The Goal? Has anyone read The Phoenix Project? Some people. So these are a, a, a novel written about how... Well, I'm not going to say consultants, but coaches go into an organisation and work with them to understand their problems. And when I read this, it kind of made theory of constraints and how it links to Kanban very, very clear for me. And it's a super easy read because it's written as a novel and I read it in about two days. If you were just going to read one of those books. Which was? Sorry, just top in your one. Which one's kind of more practical? Ones. If. So they're working on version two of this at the moment, okay? So the Kanban book. So it's a little bit older, this book. I would go for Kanban and Inside. And if you've got a spare five minutes on the toilet, I'd read the essential <laughs> Kanban guys, because it's pretty quick, okay? So free, and that one is definitely worth an investment. If you come on my course, you get to pick one of those for free. <laughs> Okay. To be honest, I've read most of those, but there is one book that I've actually found better, to be honest, and that's okay. the Kanban in Action, mm. because it's, it, it's a very light read, it's, it's very graphical, and yeah. it, it, it helps digest the information. Yeah. So Kanban in Action, so that's, a, that's a, another one that you can certainly um, have a look at, and I forget the name of the guy who wrote it. I like Lean from the Trenches. Lean from the Trenches? Yeah. Yeah. 
isn't representative of the only books available. <laughs> <laughs> Just some of the ones that I read and that I like and is a good place to start. Google, you can find as many as you want. So I'm really sorry that I was late for you tonight, but I hopefully that the 15 minutes was worth um, that extra time, and if not, there's pizza that can and beer that can appease that as well. So thank you, and if you want to have us questions to talk about sizes of stories, then you can come and ask me afterwards. Thanks very much, guys. I just wanted to quickly say before we uh, before we wrap up that uh, obviously thanks very much to Helen for the talk. Thanks to Equal Experts for obviously hosting, and um, they put on all the beers and the and the, the food. So we're really really great, grateful for them. Um, I wanted to. Um, simply wanted to tell you about the next um, meetup group um, as obviously we do want to keep this um, keep this going keep the momentum up so next month it's going to be on Thursday the 29th of September um, it's going to be at Camelot the guys who do the um, Camelot Global who do the National Lottery and it's going to be focused on DevOps um, we've got um, one of the lead DevOps guys from Sainsbury's he's going to, going to talk to us about that um, so I really, really hope you, that most of you guys can, can join us. Obviously, um, it's all going to be posted on the Meetup group as, as always. And there is a video camera recording tonight's talk. So if there's something you kind of want to um, want to revisit, it's going to go on to YouTube. We'll put it all on the Meetup group again. So just stay tuned to that. So um, thanks very much for coming and uh, look forward to seeing you next time.